My name is Colin Tate. I'm the CEO at Connexus Financial. Welcome to Redefining Leadership. And thanks to our partners, MLC Wealth. I'm delighted today that my guest is David Gonski, a private, discreet and humble man that is known to anyone that has followed Australian public life over the past 30 years. His career has seen leadership roles within the law, investment banking, media, tertiary education, sovereign investments, philanthropy, and the arts. David's breadth of governance and stewardship responsibilities are equal or in excess of anyone you care to mention in Australia today. However, this conversation is an opportunity to draw upon the experiences and the insights of the man. And I'd like to declare from the outset that David joins us as a private citizen and none of the conversation today relates in any way to that of the organizations that he represents. David Gonski joins us today to draw upon a life of leadership, what he has learned, what he wants to achieve in the future, and how we can all collectively redefine leadership to build confidence for all of our futures. David, it's a great pleasure to welcome you. So David, let's start um, at the beginning. You uh, were born in South Africa. Who were the leaders in your family? I'd love to know how they shaped the way you think and how you look at the world. Well, I am the product of uh, a mother and a father, as many are. Um, my father was um, a, an immigrant to South Africa, uh, an immigrant who didn't speak English uh, from a fairly impoverished family. And he strived in, throughout his life to become a man of medicine. And he became a brain surgeon. Um, he never, ever cared much about assets other than perhaps some woodwork that he enjoyed doing. He was always wanting to look after people, to care for them. And he bore his humbleness amazingly. Even, you know, many brain surgeons become quite arrogant. They save lives. They make decisions as to who lives and who dies. But Dad was a very humble person. And, um, you know, something that I really watched with great uh, uh, joy. My mother, she came from a much wealthier family, a more established family in South Africa. Um, she loves and still does at 91, the arts. And she had this feeling that you had to look more broadly in life, that you couldn't just do your job. Um, you had to look at the arts and enjoy things. And my poor dad, would be working 25 hours in his uh, uh, surgery and so on, and then be dragged off to see a play at night. But I watched the two of them have a wonderful, I think it was 60 plus years of marriage, and they gave us a good life with actually very good roots that basically we knew that there was much more to life than just the things you can buy with money, and indeed the sort of fairly cushy life that we had. So given your dad was a brain surgeon, what led you to investment banking and being a lawyer? Well, being honest, I wanted to be an architect. And in my day, architects had to draw. These days, they can use all sorts of wonderful CADs and other things. I can't draw for my life. And I have, I think, wonderful ideas. I've built five houses. I, I love buildings and things like that but I couldn't really be a great architect. And uh, over time, I got nagged a bit by my dad that I should become, if not a neurosurgeon, because he didn't think I was that good with my hands, maybe a neurologist. And in the end, I plucked up courage and said, the only thing I think I can do quite well is speak. So I decided I would be a barrister. So I joined the law and in fact, was never a barrister, but that was the idea behind it. Presumably very good at thinking and speaking, I would, I would suggest. So, so tell me, as, a, um, as an immigrant to Australia, how much did that have to do with your view of the world now today as David Gonski, a leader in so many parts of business and, uh, and society, being an immigrant? Well, let me firstly say I was a very young immigrant. I came at the age of seven to Australia. And I came, by the way, <clears throat> by Rolls-Royce engine because basically... We came on an aeroplane all the way from Cape Town. 
By the way, it took 36 hours door to door. Not something you turn around and go back on that same day. Um, I came here, but I still felt and still do today that I am an immigrant. And there are two things that come to my mind when you ask the question. The first is Australia was so open to us, so wonderfully friendly to us. Um, I was one of four children and we were all under the age, I was the eldest of seven or younger. Mum and dad were not allowed to bring many assets from South Africa in those days because of exchange control rules. So we started here and the friends came immediately. Australians were so open to us. Yes, we did speak English, but with a very funny accent. And basically, you know, our, my memory is of a very, very happy immigration. The second thing about being an immigrant is there is absolutely no doubt, and I have it even today in my 60s, that every morning I get up and I have to prove myself. And every night, the fact that I've survived and maybe done a few good and bad things, I know that the next morning I have to start again. And I think that's the case with many immigrants, why many really strive to succeed so well, because we do know that we have to prove ourselves in this wonderful country that's taken us in. So you're also Jewish, of course. So I'm keen to understand, when did you first experience in life either prejudice for your being Jewish or racism for your being South African, or have you not? I'd have to say that I've found Australia absolutely wonderfully open to somebody who I've never hidden that I'm Jewish. I, it's very hard for me to hide that I didn't come from Australia because my accent at times gives me away, which, by the way, is surprising as I've almost been in this country 60 years now. I found, you know, life here, I'm very aware of racist incidents, but personally haven't had any. The closest I've come was that when I was in fifth class at school, which would have meant I was about nine or 10, somebody felt that, as he said, that I had a very toffee accent. And he took out a knife and sort of put it near me. And uh, I've got to be honest, I'm not a great runner, but I would have won the any race at that point. I ran for miles uh, with that knife uh, uh, in my mind. And uh, that was the closest I came to a real act of saying, you're not welcome here. And by the way, I kept away from him for the remaining eight years of my school life. Mm, I bet you did. Was that your first experience of physical violence or physical threat? Absolutely. I did have another one subsequently, but that had nothing to do with the fact that I was, you know, had a funny accent or I was from a, a minority religion. Um, that was a case of where I disagreed with them on a particular thing and I suppose I was winning, so they punched me. So a reminder to our audience, uh, welcome if you've just joined us. This is Redefining Leadership and we're open to your questions. Um, if you'd like to identify yourself, your name and organisation and your question for David Gonski, uh, we'll be coming to a section uh, in the middle uh, of this hour uh, where we will be going through those questions. David, let's move to one of your great passions in life and that is education. Uh, um, you've, you've been involved in, uh, in, in, in lots of education um, uh, reform of, of late, including the Gonski Review. Um, I guess my first question I'd like to ask is, what are your fears for universities as we enter this time of curtailed and movement of people? What does that mean through this COVID-19 experience for our universities? Let me start by saying I'm incredibly proud of the Australian universities obviously extremely proud of the one I'm Chancellor of, but proud of all 40 of them in Australia. They punch above their weight, they do great teaching, they do great research, and I think they contribute enormously. And indeed, when you see what they're contributing in relation to COVID-19, you know, many of the researchers that are advising the government and, and business come from universities. What do I fear for the universities? The model we have in Australia of how we fund universities doesn't really work. 
In essence, we are funded to educate local students, which is fine. But universities need to research. We need research and development in Australia generally. And we don't receive much funding for that. I don't decry some of the medical funding in particular that governments give, but we don't receive a lot. So what's happened over the years is most of the research universities have sought to educate the world, not just because it's wonderful in soft diplomacy types and you get wonderful students as well, but because it becomes a good business which raises monies and allows you to increase the size of your research budget. If we can't have international students, and by the way, I'm still very optimistic we will be able to in the years to come, and I hope we do, but if we can't, then we will not be able to do the research that is so important to Australia. Many um, have looked at university research as being that research that starts the great inquiry. And when you look at solar panels, quantum mechanics, all these sort of things, they've all started off and been really got going in the universities and indeed the universities of Australia. You um, are currently doing a review on behalf of the Morrison government into TAFE. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your views that we've become, is it arguably elitist in terms of university, that everyone must go to university and perhaps university isn't for everyone and there are other forms of education that could be more suitable or more valuable? Well, let me just firstly uh, point out TAFEs and the skills situations are basically state-based. So the review I'm doing is for the Berejiklian government, obviously in New South Wales. Um, the situation that you refer to is a very, I think a very prescient point that you've come up with. Whether it is because careers advisors generally have degrees or whether it is because universities have, I think very well shown how you get into university, what you can do. And I'd also say, successive governments have, with my concurrence, made it easy and indeed suggested to people to go to university. But what we have now is that if you don't go to university, you're seen as perhaps not having done what you know you should do. And I think that's quite wrong. And if I may just take an, an, an anecdote, and the other day we had a bit of a flood in our kitchen. And it made me reflect that the Messiah who would come through the door and fix that was not a urologist or a mechanical engineer from my university, but a good plumber. And by the way, he was an A1 plumber who came and sorted it out. The point I make is that I believe people should be able to think through which way they want to go and be proud of which way. If you are a very skilled person, and don't have degrees, you should still be lauded. And by the way, that does not decry the wonderful things that universities can do for some. David, what needs to be done for the future of mediaship, particularly at a time when we have leadership division and a time of fake news? Well, the first thing I would say to you about knowledge and about media. It's quite interesting. If, if you study history, and I love history, you know, it's got some real tall tales and I enjoy them. Um, if you look back in history, those who profited from about the 1600s were those who were educated and could read and get information. Today, fortunately, most of us can read. In fact, you know, if you look at the world, there are some who can't but the bulk of the world can read. The problem we've got now is that we've lost the ability to determine what information is worth what. So we're inundated with whether it be tweets, Facebook, and whatever, and there's nothing wrong with them. But our ability to say, well, if it comes from Oxford or Harvard, maybe it is better than if it comes from Mrs. Jones, who lives down the street. And by the way, in some circumstances, it may be reversed. So I believe the future of getting over fake news and so on is to teach all of us, and that means us oldies as well as young people, 
to be discriminatory of the information given to them, to question, to probe, to check the sources of what you're getting. And the people who will do really well in life, in my opinion, are those who will think outside the box, but at the same time will not just accept what's told to them, but respectfully and cleverly question. Changing subject, uh, Dave, we have a lot of territory we'd like to cover. Um, we already have many questions coming in. Sustainable stewardship. Are boards around the world, do you think, ready to lead the corporate sector into a time when ethics, the environment and social governance truly matter? I think that boards are going that way. I mean, you'd expect me to say I like the idea of having non-executive directors. And for years, non-executive directors have led in many fields. We've been led into the question, obviously, of remuneration, and that was by our shareholders wanting some objectivity and some uh, lack of conflict of interest in determining. I think they were right. But we also have a role to be determinative of really what we're seeing outside the company to bring to the company the ideas, whether it is that we come from government, whether it is that we come from other businesses, or whether we're just people who have trained in particular areas that are different to where management are. And I think we're doing that. I can tell you right now, at the ANZ Bank, I chair our Ethics and ESG Committee, and I'd have to say, and you'd expect me to say, it's one of the most interesting three hours per board meeting um, that we, we spend questioning, you know, are we doing the right thing on these things? And I have watched with great approbation how our management over the last four or so years has moved to questioning not only themselves, and they've got their own committee now of that, but bringing it to us to say, what do you think? How have you, how have you handled the stress this year, David? I imagine even somebody as seasoned as yourself has found has had things keeping you awake at night and found the um, economic hardship and job losses and other things we're witnessing in Australia and around the world distressing. But without putting words in your mouth, how do you handle the stress and what, what has been keeping you up at night? Well, let me start by saying that, you know, I, unlike many, have, you know, a, a nice house to live in. I don't have a lot of people sharing my rooms with me. I'm not homeschooling, um, et cetera. So for me to fuss about the period that we've lived through, it would be ridiculous. I'm very uh, lucky uh, to be able to do that. But I have lain awake at night because there are decisions I've had to make in relation to the various organisations that I'm involved with, and I've got quite a variety, which were an absolute anathema to me. I don't even know that I was trained to make them. To give you some fairly neutral examples, I had to help our vice chancellor make a decision to close the library of our university. Now to close a library, a library is the heart of a place of education. Now, I should quickly say we didn't close it by remote. You could still get in through your computer, but you couldn't go and sit there and talk to people about ideas. You couldn't go and fossick and look at books or chase knowledge. To me, this was a very big thing. And to have, in fact, I was there today, to have a university where there are no students attending is quite amazing. They're all working by remote. When we closed the Art Gallery of New South Wales, which I'm very honoured to be the president of, I know my director, Michael Brand, was very pained. And I felt pain. I mean, we have this wonderful resource and no one was coming to visit it. These are decisions that you have to make, including decisions on employment, uh, decisions on people's illness, health, that really trouble one. But of course, at the same time, everybody's having to make some decisions and one shouldn't complain. One should just use the basis of, their, of one's own common sense and limited experience in these sort of things and do one's best. So let's go to some questions. Firstly, uh, it's quite related, in fact, to um, the one you just, just answered. James Frost has asked, how do you prepare for marathon AGMs and board meetings? Do you do cardio, muscle training, meditation? Or, or what, what do you have to do to be, to be uh, match fit for those, uh, those sorts of meetings? 
at my age, I'd have to be very honest with your audience. The first thing I do is go to the toilet. And you're going to laugh at that, but these meetings go, my last one went for four hours and 40 minutes. And uh, you know, it's, that's quite a, a long period. But having said that, I believe very strongly that shareholders are entitled to have their say. And, you know, I, I have been through many AGMs now in my time. Sometimes people get a bit carried away occasionally, but only occasionally questions are really out of order. In general, I'm quite um, reassured by the intelligence and substance of the shareholders who ask the questions. And so I would say to James, no, I don't do muscle training, etc. But really, all I have to do is stand. And by the way, I think it's important you stand for four hours and 40 minutes, which is not a mean feat, but doable. Greg O'Neill, who is uh, Greg O'Neill, OAM, the founder of Latrobe Financial uh, in Melbourne, is asking, what is the one tip that you'd give to young leaders starting out today to focus on? I think, I think that's a very uh, astute question, by the way, and clearly from somebody who did start out and obviously built a, a, a large company. I would say to those, firstly, they should not be put off by all the things that will come in their, in their way. The wonderful thing about starting a business is, I think, imagination. And by the way, I would also say to them, don't get too carried away either by losing focus. So if you can be an imaginative, focused person who deals honestly, properly, and with purpose with everybody, I would have to say in the climate that's coming up, which will absolutely be the territory of hardworking, imaginative, and strong people, I think one could do very well. Question from Rosalie Delabrigi. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, uh, from UTS Business School, one of your competitors. Uh, her, her comment firstly is, it's a very interesting presentation. Could you please comment, David, on the issues we are now seeing in poor governance, ethics, and a lack of responsibility taken by management at the top? Well, I think the first thing I would say is that there's always been um, quite a lot of poor management and so on. And indeed, one of the strengths, I would say, and sometimes it's been quite tricky for people on boards like me, one of the strengths is it's in the open and people talk about it. And I think that's a good thing. But I'm sure Rosalie at, at UTS would agree with me, most directors are decent people trying to do a good job. And I'd also have to say my experience of management is sometimes management gets carried away, but in general, they try hard and they need the direction and purpose from the board to be kept on the straight and narrow. But having said that, generally, they try and do their best. Brendan Casey is asking a question. Uh, until recently, he was the Chief Investment Officer of REST Superannuation Fund, one of our largest industry super funds, as you'd be aware. Thanks, David. Great to hear your thoughts on leadership. What are your thoughts on the financial leadership of our federal government, specifically the super on super and retirement incomes? Well, Brendan knows, because he's an absolute legend in the industry, he knows that uh, if I got started now, this entire hour, maybe the next 10 years, would keep going. So it'd be a great program for you, Colin. Um, but what I would say is this, firstly, don't forget, being older, I remember before we had compulsory superannuation, I think that was a great idea. I think the big super funds have done superb work. I really mean that. And I think the way many, you know, through IFM or whatever, invest in our um, infrastructure has really made this country. And I think, by the way, we'll be depending on them well into the future. So I believe in superannuation. On the question of whether it should be at 9%, 10% or 11%, this is an issue I don't really want to get into at this point because I'm not an expert on it. But I think what it has done, the whole concept of superannuation, is to allow us as a country to save, not just put monies into our own homes, 
And I think that's a great thing. On the question, by the way, which is very prevalent today, do I agree with the government allowing people to take some money out in these times? I actually do. And, you know, whether they have done the right thing with that money, we will see. And there'll be PhDs, whether it be at UTS or at my University of New South Wales, ahead of us. But I think the government did the right thing. I think it was clever. And when you look at the numbers, which I've seen, it actually had, in some ways, a bigger effect than just JobKeeper in terms of spending uh, in the marketplace during the uh, during this period. Thank you, David. And again, if you have a question, please push it through on Slido, but do give your name and organisation. We'll be giving preference to those rather than those which are anonymous. Think from Kerry Pratt from New South Wales State Super. How can you successfully build a truly diverse board by gender, but also by age and experience? Well, that's a, that's a great, uh, great point. By the way, we started some years ago and realised suddenly, it only took us about 200 years, that we were selecting the best people from about 49.9% .9 of the population because we were only picking the men. And I think it's been a significant move to move to getting the best people from 100%. And there are plenty of women who are doing a fantastic job as directors. And I'm really pleased when you see the results of the 30% club and so on, that in the top 200, 30% of the directors are women. And I think that's a great thing. But the question must go further. We do need diversity of thought. If I look, for example, at my own board, the ANZ board, I asked Jane Holton, who was a public servant, to join our board. And I cannot tell you what a fantastic addition to the board she has been, because she sees things through her training, which is different to mine. I've never been a public servant. And I think, I've, and I've said this very openly, and I'll say it again, the concept of a board of directors who are all identical to me is too horrible to contemplate. I don't believe, by the way, that we'd make great decisions and we'd probably argue with each other anyway because I'm argumentative. But the fact is we do need diverse backgrounds. Now, as to age, yes, I think we do need more diversity of age. And by the way, that goes both ways. We, need, we mustn't reject our older people, and you'd expect me to say that, but the concept of you know, people in their mid-70s being put out to pasture is ridiculous. In America, that doesn't happen. Indeed, that we may even have a president, at least two, either one will be in their mid 70s, one over mid 70s. I think we need to allow some of the older people to contribute, but also some of the younger. Whether somebody starting out in business would do well on a board will depend on what that board is. If it's a startup, maybe. If it's associated with young people, young ideas, maybe. But to force someone who's never been in business onto being you know, a trustee of some you know, large super fund or something, I'm not totally convinced. I think you need some general business experience. But it is something we should all seek and we should make sure that a diversity of thinking is around our boards. And uh, excellent person to uh, to bring up the next question. Uh, one of our great leaders, uh, woman leaders, Debbie Blakey. She's the CEO of Hester Superfund. Her question is, David, I'd be interested in your views on what courageous leadership is, perhaps an occasion of your courageous leadership that you're most proud of. Well, the first bit is easy. What I would aspire to as courageous leadership. The second bit, whether I've actually ever done it, I'll come back to in a second. <laughs> I would say, and it's a good question, that courageous leadership is to take a long-term view when everybody is shouting for a short-term situation. And by the way, talking to a lot of super funds on this uh, broadcast, they do take a longer-term view than we have traditionally. And I think they're starting to model and push a lot of us in business to also think long-term. I've spent a lot of my career working on Singapore companies. I was on boards there for more than 10 years. Their aim is to build something for the long term. Often our thinking is next Tuesday is the long term, and we've got to learn to think longer. 
the courageous leader develops a proposition that they believe strongly in. They check it, they nurture it, but it is often courageous to go against the stream. And often the stream is wrong. People might be saying, you know, that you should put plastic on your roofs of every company, put plastic on the roofs because it's going to rain tomorrow. But if you believe it won't, and indeed you're looking out a few years and you put steel on your roof or whatever the equivalent is, that is courageous leadership. She asked a very pertinent question, have I done it? And my answer is, yes, I have, but probably not enough. Tim Mitchell Adams has a question, which is, has corporate regulation become so onerous Australia, that aspiring board members are being dissuaded from being a non-executive director, being a non-executive non director? And if so, how do we solve this challenge? Um, the first thing I would say is I'm not convinced. A lot of people tell me that excessive regulation is deterring directors. And a lot of people also talk about the liability of being a director, which is the other part of that, deters. And it's, I'm sure it deters some, but I'm not aware that it's a significant number. What worries me is a bigger problem <coughs> with regulation, that increasingly it's becoming a bigger percentage of how much time you spend within the board. So you might, in the, you know, in my day, I, I became a director when I was 28. It's a long time ago. I don't remember spending much time on regulation and indeed the lawyers, and we didn't have many general counsels in those days, it was usually uh, law firms outside, we left it to them. Now regulation is everywhere and I'm not saying it shouldn't be, but I do think a good board must put aside enough time to actually think about the future have strategy days and whatever, and try and rise above the immediacy of the regulation. Obviously doing its job to comply with regulation and making sure that one you know, is ahead of uh, the game in terms of where regulation is going. I'd also have to say, you know, when I look at the, the good boards that I've seen, one looks at the regulation and tries to improve one's company around it. So if one has strayed and isn't up on that regulation, well, make sure that you not only get it right, but you maybe use it as a way of making your uh, management do other things that are good for the business. Many questions here. We'll fly through a couple more before I go back to some of mine. Michael Swinsberg of Alexander Hughes Executive. What are the key character traits in modern chairs and CEOs to ensure sustainably well-run corporates that truly are attuned with all their stakeholders and modern societal demands? How do we build better governance in the financial services sector to avoid another Royal Commission in 10 years' time? There's a lot of questions well, that, there, I think. That's another question that could go for days, but it's a good question. And I, I would say, firstly, I think when I started out years ago, the chairs of the companies were generally very, not only were they, by the way, large men, they were always over six foot six, which terrified me because that was a long way from my height, um, but they were very strong. They made decisions and they were categoric. I don't know because I was young whether it was that easy to question them. I don't think that's the modern chairman. In my opinion, and I've said this many times, some people disagree with me, the great chairman is a great conductor of an orchestra. They know that they have to listen to every instrument that's there, every director round the table, and indeed the management, uh, the senior management as well. Their job is to coordinate all that are there and to make sure that actually they play not just in harmony, but in fact that they take the music forward. And therefore, a, a chair who is, hasn't got it, his vanity or her vanity, it's usually him uh, that has a problem with vanity, but um, his or her vanity is not under control, I think would not be a great chairman in the modern world. And we have to remember who we are. We are the representatives of the shareholders, and we're there also these days to have an ear to the community. 
to see what's required of our company in the community and to be of assistance to our management. Generally, management is working 24 seven for the company. The beauty of non-executive directors is that they come in and they come out and go and see other things in the community and listen to the community. So those are the things I would suggest, but I do want to say there are many other things I could say, but I think I'll get your chagrin if I, if I keep going. Uh, can, I, can I ask though, uh, it sounds like you agree with um, the notion of a social license in what you've just said. I believe, well, social license is a term that's bandied around. I believe, by the way, everybody, not just a public company, not just a private company or a small business or indeed an individual like me, I think we all have to value the community we're in. You cannot expect the community to favour you, take your products, uh, basically look after you if you're an individual as you get older, unless you give back in some way. And so I believe if social license means that, I believe in it very strongly. And I would have to say that most of the companies I've been associated with, there would not be one dissenter round the board that would say to you that we don't have that concept of social license. And we've got to adhere to it. So uh, we haven't touched on the uh, what will avoid another Royal Commission in 10 years, but let's park that one for the moment because I think, as you said, that might take hours to go through. David Murdoch asks a great question, Paxton Bridge Financial. Across the various boards that you've sat on, what has been your greatest learning experience? Tough question. Yeah, no, but it's an interesting thing. I would say I've had many learning experiences because I've now lived through four, maybe five, depending on how you count them, financial downturns. And by the way, I've learned in the financial downturns that this is where you can actually add value. This is where you can see great management. This is where you can see businesses really built. Something I wouldn't have said before I started uh, my, my journey. I would have thought boom times were great times. But if he pushed me, if David pushed me to one, I'd have to say I was on the board of Westfield for many, many years, and I listened and watched Frank Lowy. Here was a man who started with nothing, and he seemed to know, and one day I must ask him whether he really did, but he seemed to know quite often that we were at A, and he seemed to know we had to go to B. I learned very early in my career that my expertise was in assisting people to go from A to B, much more than being definitive that B was the right spot. Of course, I would say that makes one a good conductor of an orchestra. But having said that, it was wonderful to watch this and to see how when bad times came, which it did, uh, whether it be in the retail area and so on, he was always a step ahead. And in you know, hard work, perception, listening to people, and basically showing strength, but a benevolent strength, a strength that allowed for people to be involved and a strength that didn't come across and shouldn't as being hubris. Yeah, wonderful. Well, he certainly uh, could see ahead uh, because he sold uh, at, a, at a perfect time as it seems to be in hindsight. And, uh, and, and sadly, the, the new owner Spectre um, has uh, declared a three and a half billion dollar loss in, uh, in the last week, as you would be aware, which is it's a real shame because of COVID. Let's go to this question um, as a final question for the moment. Uh, David Knox, uh, Professor Dr. David Knox uh, at Mercer. Uh, David Gonski, thank you very much for your wisdom. As a fellow baby boomer, should we be concerned with in intergenerational equity? If so, how can we balance the current pressures that seem to disadvantage the millennials? Yeah, that's a great question, a really uh, a perceptive question. You know, the baby boomers can think well, actually. <laughs> I mean, not to be outdone, I would say to David, yes, I'm thinking of that. And my own view is this. Firstly, not every baby boomer is rich. So we have to be aware that many do struggle. Many have had bad times, and particularly perhaps even now, because this uh, terrible pandemic, does pick on the older people. But having said that, 
I think we as baby boomers have an obligation for the millennials. I think we need to guide them. I think we need to assist them. If we have additional monies, we should be, whether you call it philanthropy, whether you call it giving money to your children, um, but obviously, by the way, not making them lazy, but helping them get to their next step. And I think above all, I think we as baby boomers, we're sort of gifted a purpose. You know, my father struggled, as I said earlier, and basically I sort of expected that I would take that legacy further. That was my purpose. Whether millennials have as clear a purpose is still to be tested. And I think as baby boomers, it's our job to help them to the next stage. They have different problems to us. They're wonderfully clever. And in my opinion, um, you know, deserve our assistance. So David, now let's move on to the third and final part of this chat, uh, and that is uh, leadership of the future. And let's start uh, by acknowledging the COVID-19 pandemic environment in which we all find ourselves. And this has clearly produced considerable challenge to life as we once knew it, with economies shutting down, uh, socially distancing that's indefinite, reduced international travel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What do you feel like the strategy is right now to get out and through this time? Well, you know, if I knew, by the way, the strategy categorically, I think I'd be a very foolish person to just state it. There's such wonderful people, some of which I mentioned earlier, working on a 24-7. You know, I am a, a fringe player on that. But let me put to you this. I believe very strongly this is a health crisis. And people will say, oh, that doesn't take you very far. It's, it's obvious. But that's not the way everybody looks at it. Many people look at this as an economic crisis. In my view, it starts as a health crisis, and it may well, sadly, have economic crises that come with it. As such, the first thing we need to do is to look after our health, and indeed, the next thing is to try and stop this pandemic. I agree with lockdowns. I may be perhaps one of the few who believe in that, but I do. And then I say to myself, yes, the economic consequences are going to be severe, but we've got to now work towards helping that. I believe in JobKeeper and so on. I think it was the right thing to do. Um, and I think that that you know, will show in history that that was the right uh, uh, act to keep people uh, without starving and to give them some hope, etc. Having said that, now we have to work through you know, how we get out of the lockdown in terms of Melbourne, what we need to do to get small business, and we are a country of small business, going again. And basically, in my opinion, seek to solve the health problem first and then adjust our economics to solve the economic crisis. It's not going to be easy, but having said that, I, I, I like to call myself a pessimistic optimist. And there are very, very many that I deal with daily who are pessimistic pessimists, and I disagree with them. We will come out of this. It's a question of when, and it's a question of you know, how that will actually manifest itself. So David Elia, the CEO of Host Plus, has just sent in a question asking, has your leadership style changed on the back of the COVID pandemic? And what way have you had to adapt? I, well, I mean, in terms of adaption, we've all adapted. I mean, I'm talking to you from my home. Uh, throughout my career, I have left home at seven in the morning and tried to get home at eight o'clock at night. And I've been out, you know, the whole day. Now, for the last 14, 15 weeks, I've basically been at home. So one does adapt. You know, most of what I do, like most of what probably everybody I'm talking to does, is Zooming. By the way, I thought Zoom was associated with cars 16 weeks ago. <laughs> now it's to do with computers. Um, but in terms of actual leadership style and adaption, it's quite interesting that one of the benefits of COVID-19 for me has been that I've actually started to really push in my long-term thinking. In the past, yes, like anybody else on a board or whatever, I've been keen for our half yearly profits to increase. 
for shareholders to be happy when I'm doing my long stint at the AGM. But having said that, COVID makes you realize it's not going to be fixed in 10 minutes. So what we've got to do is to think longer term. And we've got to manage to make sure people are not suffering now and that we contribute as companies and people to our society now. But at the same time, we have to have an eye to the longer term and how we can build our companies stronger when we come out of this. David, how can we build a re-engineered international community with trust, tolerance and new systems of governance? Well, you know, you raise a very good point. And I start by absolutely confessing that I believe in an international situation. I, I love the cultures of other places. And that's not just because I came from South Africa. In fact, we were a potpourri of cultures anyway. But, you know, I think the European cultures, the Asian cultures, these are really things that can broaden the mind and indeed have broadened our communities in immigration, which I believe in, uh, and indeed bringing populations together. COVID has dealt quite a blow to that. I mean, you know, as we all know, not only is it hard for people to fly here, it's hard for people to leave here and go elsewhere. I understand why. As I've said, it's a health crisis and we've got to sort that out. I actually believe we should make sure that we look after our borders until we've sorted this all out. But I do hope that in the longer term, we all remember the richness of having international cultures, friends, ideas, trade, etc. Because we are an island and we can't just survive as an island all on our own. And we've shown great, in my feeling, proficiency in trading overseas, in educating people from overseas, and indeed enjoying their cultures. So a more uh, intimate question, um, if I may, David. Um, a few years ago, I had the privilege of being with you in Israel. And during that trip, we visited Yad Yashim, which is the uh, World Holocaust Remembrance Center and Eternal Flame and uh, uh, in Jerusalem. I'm wondering when um, yourself and your wife, Orly, visited that place for the first time and were by that flame with uh, with some friends and business colleagues, what you were thinking and experiencing. And the second part of that question is, are we in a world where that kind of thing can happen again? And are you worried that the toxic populist uh, politics of the world um, is leading us down a very dangerous path? For me, Yad Vashem and that visit that you were there uh, was an amazing event. There were 40 of us, you may recall, uh, drawn from all different lives. Some were Jewish, some weren't. Some were from academia, some were from business, as you and I were, uh, and so on. And when we had that service at the end, having spent two hours seeing the, the fury of the Holocaust, seeing the displacement of, of little children, the killing of innocent people, I remember, well, I've got to be honest, Colin, I remember you crying as much as I was. And I respect it as I look around, there was another bank chairman there crying away. People say bank chairman don't cry, they're wrong. Um, we were really touched by this. And as we put, you may recall those three wreaths on the thing, I felt we must make sure this doesn't happen again. Which brings me to your second part of your question, could it happen again? Absolutely. And indeed what annoys me a bit is it has happened in some cultures, talk about Rwanda or whatever, and I did nothing about it. I mean, I still remember many of you would have seen the film, I think it was called Hotel Rwanda, which dealt with the thing. And I went home and started to research what happened there. This happened during my lifetime, and I was so busy looking after my own minuscule problems in Australia, I didn't think about it. The Holocaust, because of my background, uh, and indeed that of my wife's family, meant a lot to us. So, of course, we knew about it. And I believe it could happen again. And Australians who have a wonderful equanimity on the whole need to fight against that. And we need to savour each person's right to work within their lives as long as they don't hurt others and as long as they you know, contribute to the mutual good. 
So let's use the last 10 minutes to talk about the future and what excites you about the future. So let's start with that as a broad question. And then I would like to know a little bit about your belief in artificial intelligence. I know you have some strong views that it's something to be embraced and not feared. Well, let me say, and a question was asked earlier about the millennials. You know, and one of my children is a millennial, the other two aren't. Um, I would say to you absolutely that I'm excited by the generations coming behind. You know, I actually marvel at, you know, the people that I get to talk to, through, particularly through the university, through my work, through the schools. I mean, I felt the other day I addressed a class at a school. By the way, they were nine years old. And this young nine-year-old girl gave a speech to welcome me. And I went home thinking, you know, if she can do that at nine, we're pretty safe. She, we're going to be just fine. The talent is coming. And quite often, you know, I look at myself and I think with all I've worked through, perhaps I've got the bruises and the carefulness, the risk averseness that comes with age. And the excitement of the future is actually in the young. And artificial intelligence? Is that something to be feared or embraced? Well, I feel very, very strongly that we mustn't fear artificial intelligence. We must embrace it. Now, some people listening to this and particularly, you know, I've had many discussions with taxi drivers about this. People who drive cars tell me, but hold on, AI will take my job. Not so. I believe very strongly that the future of education is in micro-credentialing. And that, in fact, I will be almost like a, uh, uh, an old animal that I did my degrees and then off I went into law, etc. The future, and including the millennials, will keep retraining as they go. That doesn't mean they'll go back to university for big periods, although they might, but it'll mean they'll train up on new things. And if you keep training and keeping going, you actually could have the most wonderful life because I believe AI can't replace people generally. The concept of a person is the feeling you have for people, the concept of thinking outside the box. And, you know, somebody will ring you and say, I'm wrong, that you can develop a machine to do that, but I don't believe so, not as well as the human. And even in my life as an old uh, lawyer, I remember the amount of work I had to do to put paperwork together. And if AI will take that off my plate and my job will be more the thinking, the guiding, the caring, I think that will be a pretty good life. So I'm quite excited about AI, but I do believe we in business have a very important function to assist our employees to grow with AI, not to be daunted by it, but to see it as an opportunity and for them to do more that is innately human and not be scared by some of the manual functions that will be taken over by AI. So we're down to the last six minutes, David, so I'm not going to get through all of the areas I wanted to, but I'm, I, I can't let this one go. Philanthropy and the arts, you're a philanthropist in lots of different areas, and you're also the president of the gallery, uh, the Art, Art Gallery of New South Wales. Uh, how can we justify philanthropy in the arts in this environment when we have rising unemployment, people fearful for their jobs, uh, uh, a lot of uh, need in the area of poverty, mental health, et cetera, et cetera. How does art still have a, have a place in that? Many years ago, I asked that question of the great writer and thinker, David Maloof. And David answered, and indeed he wrote an essay on it, which we published when I was chairman of the Australian Council for the Arts. And basically he said, your answer, Colin, is imagine a room with no art on the walls. Imagine a room with no books on the bookshelves and imagine a room with nothing. I don't even know whether you can have your fireplace, but let's assume you can have the fireplace, but nothing else. Is life worth living? He asked the question. And as soon as you put it that way, you realize that our whole ethos of being human, our psychological thinking basically is helped by the arts. Too many people think the arts are opera, which I happen to like, and, you know, it's all the, the, the very uh, uh, the wealthier people who go to the opera and so on. That's not what the arts are. 
The arts are basically that piece of drawing that a three-year-old child does and that you cherish for the rest of their lives. It is of a great masterpiece as well that you might travel around the world in to be elevated and see what happened in the 16th century. I feel very strongly that the arts are central to not being animals, but being human. And as such, you can then justify philanthropy. And I fully understand that your philanthropy to the art might change. You might say, well, I don't know that I want to pay for a piece of arts that only the wealthy go to. Maybe I want to cultivate the arts more generally to help, you know, the, the thinking and lift the population. That's perfectly legitimate. But I don't think one can justify not giving to the arts because of this difficult time we're in. David Gonski right now are uh, in the superannuation industry, they're in the financial planning industry, and this might go much more broadly than the financial services industry. But David, tell me, what would you like your legacy to be? And what is the David Gonski version of retirement one day? Well, can I, the, the first thing I would say is, can I ask the, answer the second question first? I don't want to retire. I believe in life that if you're lucky enough that you have the means not to have to keep working for money, that you can slightly change the balance. You can do more not-for-profit work. I mean, the other day I was told that as Chancellor, I'm not worth the money I'm paid which really upset me because I do it for free. But the fact is, by the way, that was just one uh, not very nice person. It does not happen. <laughs> but the point I would make is that retirement is, in my opinion, an absolute, and that's not for me. My late father, the neurosurgeon, closed his surgery at 85 and sadly died three months later. Why did mm. he die three months later? Because that beautiful mind he had was not being used. He should have just kept going. He wasn't operating at that time, but he was giving second advice. So my view, no, I'm not going to retire. And I hope there are many things I can do in the future. In terms of uh, looking at, you know, generally the, the question of, you know, um, of life proceeding, if I may take it more broadly, I think that one has a duty to help the young come forward. And as such, um, that's a duty that gets bigger the older you get. So finally, David, what do you think we do need to do in terms of reinventing leadership to make our way through what feels like a fire front on, on, all, on all sides? Uh, we have an environment that is in trouble. We have geopolitical issues that are quite gigantic. We have a global pandemic. We have very rough economic times uh, being compared to 1930 and next year to be worse, et cetera, et cetera. Is there a new kind of leadership? I'm proposing with the title of this program that we need to reinvent leadership. Is that assertion accurate uh, or, or not necessary? And if so, what does it look like, do you think? And especially for the young people, again, that are watching this program. Well, it's interesting you asked me that question right at the end. And if I say I don't believe one should be reinventing it, you'll probably cut me. But the, the fact <laughs> is, I, I don't like this sort of reinvent as if we haven't been inventing it or reinventing it over years. I've seen leadership in the 40 plus years I've been in business change, and so it should. There are different types of leaderships for different times. In my opinion, after the war, the Second World War, that is, it, we needed very strong leaders, leaders who were almost dictator-like, in the way they run their businesses. That is not, in my opinion, the right way to lead a business today. People expect to be listened to and expect correctly to do that. People expect respect and they are allowed, in my opinion, to have that, that's what they should have. So in my view, the great leader knows, has this instinct of the long-term view, an instinct of what is right and an instinct of where they can improve their business in that longer term. And then they have this wonderful ability to bring their people along with them and make all of them think that that was their idea and that they all contributed to it. And by the way, a really great leader 
would add to that, that along the way, if the way you're going is not quite right, and your people are guiding you somewhere else for good reason, be a proper person and say, you know what, sometimes I'm wrong, and when I make a mistake, I admit it and get on with improving life and never make that mistake again. David, you're certainly one of the most articulate, humble and generous people I've ever had the pleasure of interviewing. We are unfortunately at the end of that one hour. I'm sure our audience enjoyed this. Uh, those who are watching, you're welcome to watch this on playback, on Professional Planner or on Investment Magazine. And I would recommend that you pass it through your organisations and share the wisdom of David Gonski with your family, friends, as well as your work colleagues. We'll be doing Reinventing Leadership once more, or uh, well, many more times, I hope, but certainly the next time we'll be, uh, we'll, we'll be doing it once more on the 25th of September with Kerry Kennedy, who is Bobby Kennedy, president of the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Foundation, uh, right ahead of the Biden-Trump election. And we'll talk through many issues, including uh, Black Lives Matter and the issues in the United States socially right now. But with that, we must finish up. David Gonski, thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you for your time. And I wish you a good afternoon. It's a pleasure, Colin.